Hello, this is Mona Tanjev, past president of NCSM, and welcome to the NCSM podcast, Learning with Leaders, the Game Changer series. Join me and my co-host, John San Giovanni, as we sit down and have conversations with emerging and established leaders about how they are changing the game in mathematics education. Gandhi said, we need to be the change that we want to see in the world. So listen as we talk to mathematics leaders who are being the change that they want to see in mathematics education. We will learn about their inspiration, perceptions, and of course, their game-changing actions. Mathematics leaders, we know that the status quo is unacceptable, so it's time to change the game. So yes, it is time to change the game. Hello, I'm Mona Tanjev, and welcome to the NCSM podcast, Learning with Leaders, the Game Changer series. John San Giovanni and I are the co-hosts, and today we have a new game changer with us today, Peter Liliadal. Dr. Peter Liliadal is a professor of mathematics education in the Faculty of Education at Simon Fraser University and author of the best-selling book, Building Thinking Classrooms in Mathematics, Grades K-12, through 12, 14 Teaching Practices for Enhancing Learning. He is a former president of the International Group for the Psychology of Mathematics Education and the current president of the Canadian Mathematics Education Study Group. Peter is a former high school math teacher, my kind of peep, who has kept his research interests and activities close to the classroom. He consults regularly with teachers, schools, school districts, and ministries of education on issues of teaching and learning, problem solving, assessment, and numeracy. So welcome, Peter. We are very honored to speak with you today. Oh, and thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, welcome, Peter. Um, I am so excited to, to, to speak with you, and um, let's just jump right in. And our opening acknowledgement, it's crystal clear for every teacher who has the courage to change. Our new series is about mathematics leaders who um, are changing the game of mathematics education. What does it mean to you to be a game changer? Oh, um, wow. You know, I, I, I don't, I guess that's what I'm out there trying to do. I don't really think of myself as a game changer so much as someone who's just out there trying to move the needle and further the agenda. Um, and I, I think I feel, I, to be honest, I feel like I'm part of um, a collection of people who do this. That it's not a coordinated effort. It's not structured in any way, but I feel like there's a cohort of people who are out there who are who have for a very long time trying to move us forward in mathematics education. I'm just happy to be part of that, really. Um, it's The game has been changing slowly and for a long time. And, I think the more of us that are working in that area, the better it is. So as I as I was reading your book, so I'm a former high school math teacher. So it was I haven't gone through the whole book yet. I will still spell that in, spell that information out. Um, but as I'm reading it, I was thinking about my own personal experience as a high school um, student and how engaging in mathematics in a different way would have really made an impact on me as a, as a student. And so when I think about that, that, that building a thinking classroom is in itself is a game changer. So in your own words, you know, what are the big ideas about this thinking classroom that sets it apart from what I experienced as a high school student or what you consider a contemporary or a traditional math classroom? Okay, so that, that's a very good question. So, and, and this is the essence of the work that I was doing was, it, it, it started with me spending a lot of time in classrooms and observing teaching and learning. And what I was seeing by and large was this sort of, this routine that I kept seeing over and over and over again, a, a very small set of classroom practices that teachers were using everywhere I went. And I've been, in, I've been in schools on six different continents and it, it really doesn't matter where I am. I see the same thing. Classrooms look alike, what happens in classrooms look alike. And, and that's fine if what we were seeing on the learning side was, was really positive, but I wasn't. What I was seeing in the students was that by and large, they weren't thinking, at least not in ways that we know students need to do in order to be successful at mathematics. Um, they were, the dominant behavior I was observing was mimicking. 
Mimicking is not the same as thinking. It approximates thinking, uh, but it's not the same as thinking. And I, I started to really ponder about what are the negative consequences of this? And, and if you think about it, thinking is a necessary precursor to learning. And if students aren't thinking, they cannot be learning the way we want them to be learning in mathematics, at least. So I started to really explore this idea of, so, so what has to change in order for the thinking to start to happen? And given that everywhere I was going, I was seeing the same sort of classroom routines and everywhere I was going, I was seeing students not thinking. I realized that in order to get thinking to happen, I needed to seriously work on these classroom routines. And, and rather than try to, and I think a lot of, a lot of effort has gone into optimizing um, classroom teaching in mathematics within, a, within that paradigm of those normative structures. And I wanted to do something different. So I decided I was gonna tear down teaching to its foundation. Uh, and I was gonna take nothing for granted, nothing assumed as effective. And I started working with teachers solely on the constraint that we have a set bell schedule and four walls of a classroom, but anything else that happens in there is open for negotiation. And we started trying different things that did not conform to the norm. So rather than having students sit, we had them stand. Rather than starting with front end loading of material, we put that at the end of the lesson. Rather than giving tasks textually, we gave them verbally. And, and some of this was deliberately oppositional to what we were seeing in the normative structures, but there was also a huge amount of just experimentation with thousands and thousands of micro practices, just trying little things differently and seeing if it had an impact on student thinking. And what emerged are the practices of the thinking classroom, which is the 14 ways that we can enact the things we always do, but enact them in a way that promote thinking. So for example, we all use tasks. So what, but if we want students to think, we have to give them something to think about. And so we have to give them a task that, that they have to think about because thinking is what we do when we don't know what to do. And that has a lot of impact on how we choose a task. Because if we give them something familiar, they're not gonna think, they're gonna mimic. If we show them how to do it before we have them do it, we're sucking the thinking out of it. So, so we use thinking tasks. We have the students in random groups. We put them on vertical surfaces, on whiteboards and windows to do the work in their groups. Uh, we're verbal much more than we are textual. We, we consolidate at the end of the lesson by starting at the foundational ideas. We, we, we're trying to do things in such a way that the student's mind stays engaged from start to finish. And it, visibly, it looks very different. It's active, it's loud, the students are on their feet, they're writing on whiteboards rather than on paper, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that, that, that's a game changer in many places. <laughs> well, across six continents, as you mentioned. Um, you know, your point about mimicking and, and, and versus thinking uh, relative to teaching and learning of mathematics, but really, many, if not all content, that, that just resonates so loudly with me. And it's unfortunate that, that thinking is a game changer, but but it is, right? And um, well, let's talk about the work. Awareness about this work has been prevalent um, in Canada and even globally for some time. And it's now growing in the United States, thanks to your book. Um, but in the US so far, it seems to well, have been adopted organically by pockets of teachers here and there um, who are eager to try new things or, you know, fascinated and, and interested in the pursuit of thinking. Um, but they don't always have full buy-in from their colleagues, their, their administrators, uh, families, caregivers, et cetera. So how can math leaders help bridge this divide and support adoption within a building or, or, or even a whole district? Oh, okay. So that's a big question. And I know that, uh, of course, this is, this is the audience, the idea of math leaders. And I think that that has, Organically is sort of not quite the right word. It's more like a bottom up, right? It's, it's people becoming passionate about something, infecting someone close to them, spreading it to them. And then you get this groundswell of people moving up. I, I think a lot of, a lot have, of good ideas have, 
have died on the vine, so to speak, when we try to scale up too fast, right? Um, when something is pushed down on teachers, there's a, there's a sort of reactionary uh, component to it that, that causes them to want to step back rather than step in, right? And, and it's sort of ironic because if a leader finds something that they believe in and, and wants to share that with their network and push it down onto their network, maybe that's at a school or a, a division or district level, they're doing so because they found something that they believe is good, right? But, but often the re reaction is, is negative. Whereas if they happen to bump into this on their own or they, they, they talk to a colleague who's doing this, then, then it becomes, people are more open-minded. So I always, I always talk to teachers about this because um, I always caution teachers against trying to be too, too prolific in trying to push something on other people. I say, rather than trying to push your yourself into their space, invite them into yours. Uh, use the word I a lot. So this is what I am doing. This is why I am doing it. This is what I am seeing. This is the results that I have found. Invite them into that space, into the I space, rather than pushing into the you space. And, and that's the advice I've always given teachers because there's a, there's a, a sensitive relationship with colleagues, right? In that you're equals and, and, and you don't wanna be pushing on them from a position of authority when theoretically you don't have one. Um, so does that kind of answer your question, John? It's, I've always been reticent to sort of say that this needs, anything needs to be scaled up. I think it, scaling up is the wrong word. I think it's, it's spreading up is, is sort of the idea that we want to achieve. Yeah, no, I think that's excellent advice. And I think something to take away as a listener there is this notion of inviting them into the I space instead, in, instead of a, as a leader, always pushing into the, to the U space. And, uh, yeah. that's, a, that's a huge takeaway when supporting folks. So I know that you have worked with schools and districts across six continents. I heard that earlier. Um, so you've worked in schools where they've adapted or adopted this and they're, they're building it. Have you worked in a school or district that has coaches that have provided support after you leave? And if so, like how, what are some of the, what's the roles that the coaches or, or math leaders play in, in making sure, it, encouraging teachers to continue this as they're becoming more comfortable with the model? So, okay, so this is a very good question. And, and almost every space I work in, every time I work at a district level, I'm working with coaches, consultants, or, or um, um, whatever the, the term is that's being used, because you're usually the ones who are inviting me into that district or division. Um, and then, the, then I come in and I do some work and then I leave. And then what do they do on the heels of that? And, and is it one of these situations where I'm coming in and then I'm leaving and then I'm coming back? which is of course a preferable way yeah. of doing this. Um, so what, some of the most effective that I have seen is when the coach or consultant after I leave um, opens themselves up to be invited into the classrooms of the teachers who are now experimenting with things. And they can, they can enter those spaces in lots of different ways. They can add, say, listen, uh, the most effective ones I've seen sort of say, if you want me to come in and teach a thinking classroom lesson in your room, let me know. If you want me to come in and co-plan and co-teach with you, let me know. If you want me to just come in and observe you and give you feedback, let me know. But, but having that really sort of flexible um, way that they were willing to work with the teacher, everything from I'll just do it with your kids and you can watch it and then we can talk about it to I can watch you and then we can talk about it and everything in between. Uh, is very effective. And there's some di divisions I've worked with where I'll come in, I'll do a workshop for 40 teachers. And then when I come back six weeks later, 30 of them have had the coach in their room for a lesson. Um, and again, this is not scalable, right? But, it, but it, what it does is it builds a robustness, a, um, a, a persistence within that space. Because I think when they go into these rooms, 
they're helping the teacher remove barriers. If they're co-teaching, there's two of us in the room. If they're co-planning, we're, we're doing things together. If I'm teaching, I can show you what it looks like with your kids and so on and so forth. So it's, again, it's not scalable, but it's, um, it's very effective to do that. Then the other thing that works really well is if they create, so if I come in for a session and then I come back six, eight weeks later, they've had a session in between. And that session may not be structured the same way I do it, but they've had an opportunity for teachers to come together and talk to each other about their experiences in trying something and unpacking that. And I always say that anything I have to say is secondary to when teachers start talking with each other about something that they are trying in their practice. So that one is more scalable, this idea that we're gonna have, and that doesn't have to be me. I think that's anybody that you, anytime you have someone coming into a division or a district to do work, if you can have opportunities for teachers to meet in between, to talk to each other about what they're trying, I think that really um, is a value-added accelerant in, the, in that professional growth model. So Peter, that, that is really helpful. Um, it made me think about the, the, this next question and that is, you know, in your experiences uh, working with coaches and consultants, and, you know, preferably you go back to follow up on the work and what have you, but um, have you been exposed to or, or observed things that we might do unintentionally that discourage, um, you know, growth in practice or, or teacher adoption, et cetera? Oh, um, yeah, that's a tough one. Because generally, by the time I'm working with a coach or consultant, these are people who are really good at their craft. Um, so it's rare that I would come, up, come across something that I would say is detrimental. I think something that ha that's detrimental at the system, role, uh, system level is when somehow the person who's meant to support you is also the person who's meant to evaluate you. <laughs> and I think that that dual role is really problematic. Um, it's really hard to develop the rapport with, with, uh, with, a community of teachers when you are both their evaluator and their support structure. It, and I've seen that at systemic levels happen before. And it's, it's not a good thing. And I've seen it happen at administrative levels as well, where divisions have decided that the role of vice principal is in the school is going to be to go around and, and evaluate, not in a punitive way, not in a way of this is going to determine whether you get hired again or it's going to determine your pay scale, but as part of a, as a systemic rollout of feedback. So it's meant to be positive so that they're going to come in and watch you do a lesson and then they're going to give you feedback. Nothing gets written in a record or anything like that. But then they're also the ones who are meant to be providing you the support. And even in those settings where all of those sort of punitive uh, constructs are removed, it creates a tension for the teachers to be trying to operate in this space. Um, really, they, they need to not be judged, right? And, and, and as you brought out that, that sort of four or that, uh, what I put in the front of the book for any teachers had the courage to change, I think change is, requires courage and you need people who are on your side. Um, in that, in that endeavor and are removing barriers for you, not people who are, are evaluating and judging, even if that feels gentle or is meant to be gentle. Yeah, that's one of the dangers of having that coach evaluator be the same person um, because so much of a coaching conversation is steeped in trust. Yeah. And I found it very difficult, you know, even just as a, as a teacher to trust the process knowing that in a month from now, they were then going to write my evaluation. Right. So, I mean, it's in, it's in our, our essential actions for coaching. We clearly state that that is not something we recommend, yeah. um, that coaches are there to support and not to evaluate. Yeah. So I want to shift the conversation a little bit because earlier, um, one of the things I noticed in high school classrooms Teachers are looking for evidence of student thinking pencil paper wise, um, either when they're taking notes or like students have notes to refer back to. 
And so one of the challenges of a, of a thinking classroom is a lot of that thinking is on a wall or, um, you know, it's not written down. They can't reference it when they go back home or as a teacher, you know, unless I'm like keeping a checklist or something, I don't have student work in front of me to monitor and or to form, form more formally assess. So in your experience, what norms or structures possibly had to change at a school level to accommodate and better measure and reflect the learning of students in thinking classrooms? Okay, wow. Okay, so there's the short question. Here comes a long-winded part that I warned you about earlier. Um, so a whole bunch of things here. So the first thing about, okay, let's just talk about notes. Okay, so notes yep. serve two purposes. Right, and, and we forget this often. So notes serve two purposes. The first one purpose, and these are in no particular order, one purpose is to create a record. And the other purpose is to reify your thinking. So think about when you take notes. I'm not talking about when you were in grade 11 and you were just copying what was on the board, you know, in that sort of world's slowest photocopier mode that, that we all grew up in. That is not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is you as an adult, you're in a session, someone is giving a talk, they're really engaging, you got your notepad open, you're making a few notes to yourself, right? That note taking that you're doing is not verbatim, it's not, it's, it's, it's specific, it's notes to yourself for the future when you think you might forget something, you're organizing your thoughts as part of this process. It's you're turning ideas into things in the form of notes, right? So Wanger calls this reification, right? Um, that process of turning things that you're hearing and things that you're doing into notes is a really powerful thinking activity that helps you organize the information in such a way that you can then access in a different way later. And now we, now we can, we can use all sorts of psychological terminology for what's going on inside your brain, but nonetheless, I think we can all accept that that is a valuable process. And that process is mostly forgotten in the note-taking thing we see happening in, in K to 12 systems okay. nowadays, where it's really just, I want you to copy what we're doing here. And, and my research shows that that is a mindless activity the students are checked out. We proved this in, in lots of settings and then they don't access them, right? So what's left is the opportunity to reify is gone. So now all we have is a record. Well, if all we need, if all we want the students to have is a record, well, then I'll post them online. Like that will free up 40 minutes of my lesson. We can do something more interesting with them. <laughs> um, so, so one of the things that we found happening in thinking classrooms that became really, really apparent was that there was a difference between collective knowing and doing and individual knowing and doing. And, and we were, there's, I'll give you an example. So we would be in a classroom and we'd be watching a group of students at the boards working on a sequence of curricular tasks. And we're like, wow, this is amazing. They got it. Every one of these students can do it. They're taking turns leading. No one's riding coattails. They're just getting more and more advanced in their thinking. It is amazing. We test them two days later. Nope. Okay, what happened? Where is that individual knowing and doing that we thought we saw two days earlier? So we thought, okay, we must have had rose-colored glasses on. Let's go back and look at the students working in the group again. And no, we don't have rose-colored glasses on. Everyone is demonstrating that they can do this. Test them two days later. Nope. Okay, so what's happening is there's a difference between collective knowing and doing and individual knowing and doing. And that collective knowing and doing is a really powerful sense-making space, meaning-making space. I don't wanna sacrifice that. That is where the students are negotiating, making meaning, uh, and coming to understand and discover and the mathematics that they're meant to be learning. It's a powerful vehicle, but how do we now move that collective knowing and doing from, from the collective to individual knowing and doing? That became one of our questions. It turns out that note-taking is one of the things that helps move this, but not the mindless note-taking, meaningful, mindful note-taking, where the students, and what we, what we do is we call them notes to my future forgetful self. 
what do you have to write down today so that in three weeks you can remember what you were able to do? And, and that is that reifying process where the students sit down and for the first time in a thinking classroom lesson, they have a moment to themselves, they think about what they were able to do and they make some notes to themselves. But we have to take the control away, right? We have to take the control away. And if we're worried about it, we can post some notes online, they're a great backstop and the parents think you're doing your job and, and all of this stuff. But it's having the students write those meaningful notes are really, really a vital part of the thinking classroom. The same with doing check your understanding questions, which is a rethink on, on practice and homework, two metaphors that just aren't working. Um, all right, so there's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, where's the thinking? Like, where's the evidence of thinking? And one of the things that teachers realize very quickly when they're in a thinking classroom is that the evidence of thinking is all around you. You're hearing it, you're seeing it, you're observing it, right? And it's, it's evident in a way that is very difficult to recreate on paper and pencil, right? Because it's, it's just, it's all that chronology gets flattened out and all that diversity and, and the nonlinearity gets flattened out and all you're left with is this sort of linear textual thing that the students have produced. And it's, it's a proxy for thinking, but it's not actually thinking. Um, so if you wanna evaluate thinking, if you really wanna see what students are thinking and how they're doing, one of the things that you have the possibility to do in a thinking classroom is you have the possibility to shift your assessment from product-based to observation-based. And of course, triangulation of data and all of these contemporary views of assessment outcomes or standards-based assessment allows for this to happen. It's just that when you're in a thinking classroom, that, that, that possibility is realized in such an easy way because there's so much to see and so much to listen to and so much, so many ideas to engage with. So does that mean we, can't, we don't test students? No, you can still test students, but, but recognizing that sometimes watching a student in action is actually much more productive for assessment purposes than having them sit down and write something on paper. That's not to say that that's not useful, it's just that there's a greater possibility. And Peter, that's a perfect pivot into the last question. Um, and something that I, you know, as you're talking about mindless note-taking and, and even assessment, um, I think each of these things have, you know, or some stakeholders have perceptions about what they're supposed to be and what they're supposed to look like, right? Um, in fact, a thinking classroom might end up getting pushback from stakeholders, uh, mm -hmm. caregivers, administrators, other teachers who are accustomed to grades and homework looking a, a very certain way. Um, there might even be accusations that one is is not um, is not teaching because the teacher isn't showing the children or the students how to do math. So, um, and and some might other, might worry that students won't perform well on tests. So, I guess the question I have or we have is how, how can teachers and, and advocates of thinking respond to these um, statements? Okay, so these are yes we have seen pushback and they come from all sources, right? They come from administrators, colleagues, students, parents, or caregivers, I guess, is a, is a, is a more global terminology that you use there. We can see that. We see the pushback coming from different places. Um, and why does it? So what do we do about it? So, so some of the things, the most tragic one, I think, is when it, the pushback comes from an administrator. Um, because that puts a teacher on very unsure footing, right? I always say, when I work with administrators, I always say to them, teachers are not afraid of parents. They're afraid of administrators who don't support them in the face of a parent, right? An administrator who has your back gives you the courage to take that step forward. When you don't think they have your back, it, it's a really tenuous space to be operating in. Um, so let's talk about parents. Why do parents push back? Um, almost always the root of the pushback lies in anxiety and fear. Um, the fear that if you don't do your job well enough, we're going to have to pick up the slack at home. And, and it's really, that's a frightening thought for some people. 
right? Because they may not have the resources to do that, whether that resources is it their own mathematical ability or the finances to hire a tutor or the time to put into even looking for resources, right? It's, this is, the, 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 the anxiety is, is grounded in real things and I have empathy for that. Um, so how do we allay this concern? One of the things we found is that when we leave students to be the communicators of what happens in the classrooms, things go wrong. Um, so a student who comes home from a thinking classroom and the parent says, how, what did you do today? And the student says, I had to stand up at the front of the class and work on the whiteboard the whole period. <laughs> okay, so, so yeah, that's true. That's what they did. There was, they were part of a group of three and everyone was standing up working on the whiteboard, but what does the parent hear, right? The parent hears a 1980s version of a student being punished by having to do something at the front of the class in front of everybody else. So that's what they hear. And these sorts of things spike concerns and, and, and emotions in ways that, that we have never really given enough credit to, that how traumatizing these kinds of experiences are and how this hearing that your child is going through these sorts of things re-traumatizes these people. Um, when the student comes home and says, my, my teacher made me figure it out on my own, that is, that is interpreted as a very different way. What we have found is teachers who take the initiative to communicate to parents what it is they're doing and why they're doing it have less, much less pushback. Um, and I'm not suggesting that you do a newsletter, but teachers who do seem to have parents who are calmer. And, and I think one of the reasons is that there's a huge difference between a parent understanding that a teacher is doing something no matter how crazy it is, but they're doing it deliberately with purpose and with, with foresight and with, with, um, with professionalism. It's a very different thing than a, than a teacher seeming to just be doing something off the cuff, right? So I think that's one of the best ways to, to, to allay the, some of that pushback. Why do peers push back? Um, you know, this is a sensitive conversation and a sensitive topic, but it's, there's safety and similarity. There really is safety and similarity, and that goes beyond the teaching profession. But if we're all doing the same thing, no one is standing out, then no one is, is being pushed back, right? We're, we're all the same. Um, it, it creates situations where there is no difference between us. We ha and, and we have pacing guides and we have set things and we all do the same thing on the same day. So it doesn't really matter which teacher your, your, your child ends up with and so on and so forth. And, and, and then there's also the concern that, you know, I got to teach this student next year. So you're teaching him in grade nine. I got to teach him in grade 10. We have these state exams in grade 10 that puts a lot of pressure on me. And my job is just a lot easier if I know that the students are coming to me well prepared and what you're doing doesn't look like you're preparing them. Like these are, again, like the parents, these are real these are anxieties that are based in, in real trauma. And, and we have to recognize that. And, and, and these, are, these are difficult to negotiate. But again, purpose, literature, show, seeing that, that there is uh, a method to the madness, I think, is, is really powerful. And then when students push back, students push back primarily because this is harder, right? it's, and, and I would rather do something that's easy. And some teachers have no issue with that. Some teachers just exude this aura that this is non-negotiable and, and the students just do it. And other teachers have to you know, show them that, look, we're gonna do this and wasn't that fun and didn't you learn something and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so again, long-winded. <laughs> answer, but I hope that answered your question. I'm sure I'm not the first to have, to have highlighted some of these issues. Absolutely. And, you know, I didn't really think about the idea that, you know, students can be pushed, can, can push back on the charge of being, um, being asked oh, this, to think and reason, right? If we got, I do really want to talk to this. This is, we have not given enough credit to this. Who we are as teachers is entirely affected by who our students are as learners. Mm -hmm. So regardless of what kind of teacher you are, you, your limit is set by how the students are willing to behave. 
So the reason so many initiatives do not come to fruition is because a teacher takes a step forward and the students don't reciprocate, right? If the students don't reciprocate, that prevents you from taking that second step forward. So yeah, I think one of the powers of thinking classrooms is that it's a radical enough change that the students take that step. And now the teacher can take another step. And, and then we have a momentum that moves forward. But we have to understand that there are 30 stakeholders in the room who have a lot to say about whether or not what you're doing is going to be allowed to work or not. And they've had a lot of experience mimicking mathematics as opposed to thinking and reasoning through it. So yeah, I think that's a great point. Mona, did you have anything you want to add there? No, I was just going to say, I always, when I'm coaching teachers, I always say when they're doing some sort of shift that is not the norm of what students have experienced up to the point when they're in this classroom, I'm always like, you have to persevere more than the students. I said, because the students are going to sit there and just say no and say, I want to do it the old way. I said, so we actually, as the adults, have to have more perseverance and that like the vision of where we're going and know that, yes, it's going to be difficult, um, but I'm, I'm here to help you. And so um, the term warm demander comes to mind, right? That idea of you have, you have high expectations. And so in the thinking classroom, you have very high expectations that kids are going to engage and they're going to discuss and they're going to learn from each other. And so as a warm demander, you're, you're demanding it and you're providing that support to help get them there. I love that. So, and, and we, we found in our research, and this was an interesting byproduct, it takes two Mondays to make a change. So if you start on Monday and persevere for the entire week, and then you come back and the following Monday you're still doing it, the students just kind of go, okay, I guess this is the way it is. <laughs> that is something, <laughs> that is a perfect, perfect way for us to wrap up this evening. As a matter yeah, of fact, I just need two Mondays. Yeah. Need, That's what it is. Two Mondays. Need two Mondays. Oh. For the past 18, 18 months, it's felt like Groundhog Day. So now <laughs> we just need two or three Mondays and, and life will be better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, on that note, I just want to say thank you, Peter, for spending time with us. I know our listeners um, have gotten a lot out of it. More importantly, um, have a great new book to read. So thank you for that. My pleasure. It's been a, yeah. a real um, joy talking to you. And to our listeners, if you have read the book, um, there actually is a Facebook group, um, building, building thinking, build, think, building thinking classrooms, um, something like that. <laughs> but eleven thousand teachers. How many? Eleven thousand. Eleven thousand. Yes, I am one of them, and they are <laughs> great. Like, um, they're very honest and forthcoming, and they are so willing to share. And there's so many images of student work that are just amazing. So I just, it's a great community to be involved of a part of, even if you're just sort of lurking and what people are sharing. Um, yeah. But I have learned a ton and I've only been on it for about two weeks now, but it's just been really fun to listen to teachers and sort of what they're grappling with. So we appreciate your uh, game changing attitude here and helping us all become better at our craft. So thank you for that. My pleasure. Thank you. And Thanks, listeners, for jumping in this time. We look forward to seeing you at our next uh, next release. We hope you have been inspired by this bold mathematics leadership conversation and will tune into our podcast series each month. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and a review. You can learn more about NCSM Leadership in Mathematics Education and our upcoming professional learning events on the NCSM website at mathedleadership.org. You can also follow NCSM on Twitter at MathAdLeaders using the hashtag NCSMBold. Thanks again.